Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a very special grand round today. I'm Kerry Ressler, the Chief Scientific Officer at McLean. I'm sorry to not be doing this in person. We hope to see many of you in person again um, in the not too distant future. Um, today's special grand rounds, we're gonna hear from recipients of the Alfred Pope Award for Early Career Investigators. The Pope Award was established a number of years ago in honor of Dr. Alfred Pope, a senior neuropathologist and former director of the Ralph Lowell Laboratories at McLean. This is a, a picture here from those early days. Um, he was a pioneer in psychiatric research and Dr. Pope took great pride in educating and nurturing junior faculty. His legacy continues today through this award, which is bestowed annually to one or two career investigators and recognize the publication of an exceptional peer reviewed first authored article based on basic or clinical research performed at McLean. Um, this year, of course, um, we're very honored to have two, and you might notice that I'm related in a way to both of these, but be fully aware that I was fully um, recused from the decision-making process this year, though I'm so very proud of Nate and Lauren. So at this point, I'll turn over the program to Dr. Shelley Greenfield to introduce this year's awardees. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie, and um, I want to join uh, you in welcoming everyone to what is our very last grand rounds of the season. And um, I do want to pause for one moment to recognize Dr. Chris Palmer and his team for the grand round series um, this past year. I think it was exceptional. And um, I really felt like we had really remarkably wonderful opportunities to learn together this year. So thank you so much to uh, Chris and his team. Um, Thanks again, Kerry, for, um, for that introduction to the Pope Awards. And I wanna congratulate our two Pope awardees today, Drs. Nate Harnett and Lauren Lebois. I know both of you, and I'm very excited uh, that to celebrate uh, this award with you today um, and with the audience. Um, I, just as uh, Kerry mentioned, the Pope Award Selection Committee consists of 14 members who vote to select the awardees annually. When members of the selection committee nominate a mentee for the Pope Award, they're also recused from voting for that nominee, as Carrie mentioned, and I just want to confirm that that is the case. And that's because we had a very competitive application pool this year, and I'm very pleased to be uh, able to introduce the two awardees more formally for the 2021 Pope Award, Dr. Nathaniel Harnett and Dr. Lauren Lebois. So what we're gonna do is, um, Dr. Harnett will give the first presentation, and then um, I am going to introduce him in a moment. Then um, I'm gonna come back on and introduce Dr. Lebois, and she'll give her presentation. And then we'll have time for Q&A for both of our speakers at the end of the program. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first awardee, Dr. Nathaniel Harnett, who um, was nominated by his mentors, Drs. Lisa Nickerson and Kerry Ressler, based upon the impact of his first authored peer-reviewed publication, acute post-traumatic symptoms are associated with multimodal neuroimaging structural covariance, covariance patterns, a possible role for the neural substrates of visual processing in PTSD. Dr. Harnett is an assistant neuroscientist in the Neurobiology of Fear Laboratory at McLean Hospital, led by Dr. Kerry Ressler, and he is an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Harnett earned his PhD in psychology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham under the mentorship of David C. Knight. Dr. Harnett's research investigates the neural mechanisms that mediate susceptibility to trauma and stress-related disorders such as PTSD. His work leverages multimodal neuroimaging techniques with individuals recently exposed to trauma to elucidate neural circuitry linked to acute and long-term PTSD. Ultimately, the goal of his research is to develop predictive and preventive neuroscience-based techniques to reduce the prevalence of um, trauma and stress-related disorders. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Harnett for his presentation today, Multimodal MRI Signatures of PTSD in the Early Aftermath of Trauma. Dr. Harnett. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenfield, for that really wonderful introduction. Thank you everyone for being here. And I feel very honored um, to be one of the recipients of the Pope Award. Um, I think I have about 20 minutes to talk a bit about um, the, the, the paper that um, Dr. Reveal just mentioned. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a bit of an overview of sort of what the research is that got us to that point. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit more high level and I'll be happy to take questions during the combined Q&A 
at the end of this. Um, but I'm still going to really focus on you know, the different sort of multimodal techniques that we've used to try to understand susceptibility to PTSD when we look at individuals who are recently exposed to traumatic events. And I think that, you know, for me, when I got started in this, um, I was very much of the mind, um, not as someone who had a strong psychiatric background, of when I thought about PTSD, I thought predominantly about people in military combats or war zones. Um, and then come to find out the unfortunate reality is that there are a lot of different types of traumatic events within um, our world and our environment, ranging from serious um, disasters, natural, um, natural accidents, assaults, even motor vehicle accidents, or witnessing the death of a close loved one or friend. Um, and the way that we define trauma is meant to be inclusive to all the different types of events that can be um, seriously stressful or traumatic in our lifetimes. And if we look at um, you know, the number of people that are potentially exposed to traumatic events, I, I think that it's somewhat unfortunate that traumatic experiences aren't exactly rare within the United States. Data from the CDC suggests that there are about 30 million individuals per year who are exposed to non-fatal injuries. These are just sort of emergency department visits alone. Um, if we translate that, that's about one in 10 individuals per year who are exposed to a potentially traumatic event. And the best epidemiological data we have at this point suggests that, you know, around 50%, but probably closer to 90% of individuals within the United States will experience at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. And those individuals are then at risk for the development of you know, post-traumatic dysfunction that has serious financial, social, and emotional burdens to those individuals. And so part of our goal, part of our research program is really trying to understand how do we identify the individuals who are most susceptible to developing PTSD and other sort of trauma-related dysfunction you know, in the early aftermath of that, of that traumatic event so that we can intervene early to prevent them from developing all sorts of post-traumatic complications. So the overview of the work that I'm gonna talk about, um, and I'll talk about work from a couple different studies that we've done over the last, I guess, five or six years now, um, all follow the same general protocol. We look at individuals who have recently been exposed to a traumatic event. Um, predominantly, this is in, these are individuals who have experienced a motor vehicle accident because it's easier to um, recruit from emergency departments or acute trauma care units. We go to these individuals and we ask them if they're willing to be part of one of our studies. And we recruit them for a magnetic resonance imaging study um, and behavioral studies within about a month after the traumatic event, usually about two to three weeks. And then we typically follow these individuals over a period of three months, six months, or 12 months. And we look at how their symptoms change over time. Are they, in, are they an individual who go on to remit their post-traumatic symptoms? They go on to not develop PTSD. Or are they someone that's more susceptible? Do they go on to develop PTSD 12 months after their traumatic event? Um, and you know, the, the reason we do this is to ask really two major questions. The first is, you know, how can we use information about the brain? Can we look at an individual person's neurobiological profile and identify if they're susceptible to PTSD? Do the brain images we take predict whether or not they're going to have PTSD-related dysfunction? And then a second part of this is asking, you know, what neural signatures that we identify might be the ones that are likely to be um, identified prior to actual trauma exposure. It's one thing to look and see after a traumatic event, how people are responding, what their brain looks like, but can we find some evidence that we might be able to look prior to the trauma exposure um, and get an idea of what might happen in the future? So early on, um, one of the first places that we started to look at potential neural signatures of PTSD um, was actually resting state data. And the reason we started to do this is because there are a lot of different um, multimodal findings in chronic PTSD. So individuals who have had PTSD for a year, 10 years, decades, um, people with chronic PTSD. And some of the most um, replicable findings in terms of um, neurobiology of PTSD are in functional differences predominantly intolerance of um, the individual responses within the amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex, that sort of classic PTSD brain um, really involving hyperactivation of the amygdala and hypoactivation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And in fact, this extends to um, functional connectivity differences where the amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex are actually disconnected individuals with um, PTSD. But it extends beyond that. I mean, you know, we're talking about function, but there are a lot of other uh, modalities in PTSD that are disrupted, such as gray matter. So one of the most common findings in uh, structural MRI is this reduction of volume of the hip hippocampus. We also see reductions of the amygdala. But then if you look at the whole brain, it's actually the entire gray matter morphology of the cortex um, that appears to be um, disrupted in PTSD compared to individuals without PTSD. 
And this expands even further past to um, brain white matter, where individuals like Nagar Fani have shown that the white matter integrity, the actual structural connections that lead from one brain region to another, um, are uh, show dis disconnectivity, less structural integrity um, in individuals with PTSD compared to controls. And then also Dr. Elizabeth Dolson, who's here at McLean, has similarly shown um, things in the unsynthetic fasciculus, where the unsynthetic fasciculus, which connects the ventral medial prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, actually shows less structural integrity in individuals with PTSD. And so, you know, as we're looking at sort of the wide swath of PTSD-related dysfunction in neurobiology, we start to think, you know, it may be the case that distributed networks, distributed functional networks in the brain might be particularly important for trying to understand PTSD susceptibility. And so within the Aurora study, which is a large multi-site ongoing um, longitudinal study of adverse post-traumatic outcomes in the early aftermath of trauma, we started to look at brain networks in these individuals. This is from about 109 recently trauma-exposed individuals. And we recapitulated um, canonical resting state networks, such as the default mode network, the central executive or frontal parietal network, the salience network, and also an a priori network, which we call the arousal network really a co-activation of the amygdala and hippocampus and brainstem regions that we think are particularly important for PTSD and that I just sort of talked about there. Um, and one of the things that we found is we wanted to look and see, you know, are these networks, um, the way that they're functionally connected two weeks after a traumatic event, do they predict future PTSD symptoms? And at the time we had data going out to three months after the traumatic event so we could see, you know, are these predictive of three month PTSD symptoms? And we found two particular connections that were related to PTSD symptoms. So connectivity between the dorsal outer prefrontal cortex and a sort of amygdala hippocampus arousal network was negatively associated with PTSD symptoms. So it was more strongly coupled that this node and this network were um, the less PTSD symptoms individuals had three months after their traumatic event. Similarly, we found that greater connectivity between the default mode network and then fewer temporal gyrus was positively um, correlated with PTSD symptoms. So greater coupling between this node and this network was associated with more PTSD symptoms, which is particularly interesting for us, if only because it really did demonstrate that these sort of distributed networks and how they're communicating with one another really seem to be involved in predicting PTSD symptoms after the traumatic event. We've done some additional analyses looking at, you know, if we control for two week symptoms, do we see um, um, other relationships that pop up? And we're starting to, see, we were starting to see this, um, this association between the arousal network and the visual cortex, um, both for two weeks here, but also for three month symptoms that greater coupling between these, this node and this network was positively associated with greater PTSD symptoms. So that was really cool for us. We thought, okay, maybe functional brain imaging could be something that could be used acutely after a traumatic event to um, help understand whether or not someone might be you know, susceptible to future PTSD symptoms. One of the problems I think that we had looking at that is we were also doing a study at the time looking at um, brain function during Pavlovian fear conditioning. And what we would do is we would present um, recently traumatized individuals, um, different tones, um, either a high pitched tone or a low pitched tone. One of those tones is followed by a loud white noise, what we call the unconditioned stimulus. And we go through a period of pairing the tone and the cue, and people learn if they get the tone that they're gonna get the cue. And so one of the things we found was that in a cohort of non-trauma exposed individuals, you see the typical type of learning that you would expect where um, individuals have greater expectancy that they're gonna get the loud noise after one tone, and they're not gonna get the loud noise after the tone that doesn't have loud noise. But for trauma exposed individuals, they actually don't show that differentiation. They show high expectancy of the tone, regardless of the loud white noise, sorry, regardless of which tone that we play for them. And so there's some sort of cognitive impact of trauma, or some sort of impact of trauma on cognitive function related to threat processing. And if we look at the neural data associated with that, we actually see that there are wide swaths of changes in brain activity, threat-related brain activity um, in trauma-exposed individuals compared to non-trauma-exposed individuals um, that overlaps really highly with the same resting state networks that we were looking at before. And so although it might be the case that resting state networks can um, be useful for predicting um, acute PTSD or subacute PTSD symptoms, it's not really, because trauma then has an impact on brain function, it's not necessarily clear to us that you know, resting state networks are going to be observable pre-trauma and might be, you know, a target that we can look at in future research to say, okay, if we know what these resting state networks look like before trauma, are they still going to be predictive of PTSD after trauma later on? And so we started to move a little bit towards brain structure. Um, and what a study we were doing at the time showed 
was we reconstructed um, canonical threat-related white matter tracts, such as the unset fasciculus, which I talked about, the foreign extrude terminalis, and the cingulum bundle. And one of the things we found, um, very similar to what Dr. Olson found, was that the integrity of the unset fasciculus was negatively correlated with acute PTSD symptoms. So um, the more structural integrity that this tract has in the acute aftermath of trauma, um, the less PTSD symptoms that are that people in this particular study had. Um, and this was a study that we did with about 16 people at um, the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And when um, I came to McLean and we had data from the Grady Trauma Project, one of the first things I wanted to do was say, you know, is this gonna replicate in a larger, um, slightly more diverse sample? Um, and so we did the exact same thing. We analyzed the data um, almost the exact same way. And we found the exact same negative um, association between the integrity of the onset fasciculus and um, PTSD symptoms. Although it's not shown here on the graph on the left, this association really is specific to re-experiencing symptoms. And so it is a one-to-one -one replication um, in both of our cohorts. The other thing that's not on here is that we actually compared the white matter integrity of all of these tracts between trauma-exposed individuals and non-trauma-exposed individuals. And we didn't see any differences um, in white matter integrity, suggesting that you know these differences in or these associations between brain structure and PTSD severity really do seem to be tied to, um, really really do seem to replicate, but also it doesn't appear to be the case that trauma, trauma may not, I don't wanna say necessarily one way or the other, but trauma may not have as big an impact on um, white matter microstructure, at least acutely, um, potentially leading to sort of brain structure findings being one thing that we might look at pre-traumatically um, as a marker of PTSD susceptibility. And so what that leads into is, you know, we really wanted to try to capitalize on better understanding brain structure that might be related to PTSD susceptibility. Um, and at about the same time, we were having a conversation amongst ourselves of, you know, a lot of the work that we were doing, a lot of work that had been done in PTSD was necessarily unimodal. And what I mean by that is we would look at brain white matter, and we would look at brain function, and we'd sort of analyze them separately. Um, and then we would look at them and say, you know, they both look to be, both of these findings look to be in the amygdala or hippocampus, ventral prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. So clearly that circuitry seems to be involved and that's important. The reality is, um, and this is a great um, schematic from our view by Vince Calhoun and Jung Sui, um, which I definitely encourage people to look at, is that that is, um, at the sort of low end of how we can gather information using all the sort of data we have. All of the MRI data we have is super high dimensional and every modality you add on top of that as a, you know, a, a logarithmic or exponential factor of, of dimensionality. Um, and so if there are ways that we can try to actually look at this data together through asymmetric or symmetric fusion, we actually get a lot more information out of it. And as a sort of cute, cutesy cartoon way of visualizing that, if we just consider univariate approaches um, we're really looking at the overlap between one data set, which we might call DTI or white matter MRI, and another data set, which might be gray matter MRI. And it's really only looking at sort of the pairwise link comparisons, um, the sort of overlap between these data sets that we say, okay, that's important. The reality is with multivariate approaches, you can really look for patterns in the data sets. And so what you wouldn't have found in the univariate set is that there's this nice little smiley face that's present both in data set one and data set two. And sort of symmetric um, or multimodal data fusion approaches really let us get at those sort of patterns and try to understand what might be happening. So this leads into um, the study that Dr. Greenfield was talking about um, at, at the, during the introduction. And what we had done was we had borrowed data from the Grady Trauma Project. Again, this is another emergency department study um, with about 78 individuals who had all completed multimodal MRI. And these individuals had completed both diffusion MRI, so we were able to look at white matter microstructure. We indexed that via fractional isotropy, mean diffusivity, and mode of the diffusion tensor. Um, and they also had um, T1 MRI data, which we reconstructed to get um, measures of gray matter volume and cortical morphology measures like cortical thickness and peel surface area. And we included all of these as features in a linked independent components analysis. And before I go on, I want to strongly thank um, Dr. Lisa Nickerson for all of her training and actually doing LinkedIn independent components analysis um, and for helping me to learn all of these incredibly difficult statistical things that I'm going to give an overview now and you can ask me questions about at the end um, and we'll see how well I can answer them. But basically what linked independent component analysis actually does is allows us to decompose all the different modalities that we put in there 
into um, multivariate patterns that all share a single subject loading matrix or a single loading matrix per subject. And so what comes out is basically this. We have these different rows that represent um, the modality contributions of any one component. And those modalities um, might be, for example, gray matter volume or peel surface area. And every participant has one specific loading for this entire component. Um, and what we did is that, you know, we had so many components that we got out of this analysis. We did a further step, of a data reduction step through principal components analysis, just to try to group things together in an unbiased way and see if there are any sort of gestalt or global patterns that came out um, that we could look at in a more feasible way. And then after we did that, we came into what we cheekily called structural covariance profiles, which were basically just groups of the different structural covariance networks we'd already looked at. And then we could take these and throw them into standard statistical analyses, either in SAS, SPSS, MATLAB, whatever we felt like doing. Um, and so at the end of all of that, once we'd taken all 78 participants and we throw in all the MRI data, we get about eight different structural covariance profiles um, that really reveal a rich set of structural covariance networks and ways in which they are all connected to one another. Um, I'm not gonna go into what each of these profiles are related to um, because we didn't do that in the paper, um, but I will focus on a couple of the ones that showed interesting relationships with PTSD symptoms during both acutely and were predictive of later PTSD symptoms. Um, what was interesting um, to find was that a lot of these structural covariance profiles aren't, don't seem to be as much noise, um, both in terms of the networks and the profiles, they show relative normality. A couple don't, and I'm happy to talk at the end about why that might be the case um, for a couple of these, but these really seem to be um, um, robust and normal sort of networks and profiles that we're getting, which we were really excited about. So we did all of this um, pre-processing, all of these fancy statistical algorithms, ultimately to do a regression. Um, and what we came up with were, there were two particular profiles that were associated with PTSD symptoms, either one month after the traumatic event or revealed um, or were associated with the changes in PTSD symptoms between one and 12 months after their traumatic event. <clears throat> the first profile, which we called SCP-3, um, really um, mapped onto mean diffusivity of the white matter skeleton and of the fornix, as well as um, gray matter of the anterior cingulate cortex and inferior temporal lobe. And what we found is that this, this profile was largely positively associated with PTSD symptoms. So individuals who had um, greater loadings on this profile showed greater PTSD symptoms one month after the traumatic event. What's particularly interesting for us is that we also saw another structural covariance profile that had networks that were really associated with gray matter volume um, and fractional isotropy and mean diffusivity of white matter tracts and gray matter region and regions um, like the visual cortex, the fusiform base area, um, and again, the visual cortex and interior temporal pole really sort of a structural analog, at least visually to us, of um, the ventral visual stream. And this particular profile was positively and curvilinearly associated with PTSD symptoms both at one month after the traumatic event and also predicted PTSD, the change in PTSD symptoms from one month to 12 months after the traumatic event. Um, and one of the reasons I think we're so excited about this profile is not only is this, you know, very much looks like um, ventral visual stream to us, it's also one that we're replicating in a separate data set. So all that data I was talking about was from the Grady Trauma Project. We're also looking at Aurora now, again, that separate study, and we're finding a very similar, um, very similar structural covariance networks. You can see here um, really maps onto gray matter of the visual cortex and ventral visual stream. And again, it's um, positively associated with PTSD symptoms from these individuals both at week two and with PTSD symptoms both at month six. We don't have 12 month data yet, um, although hopefully within the next few months we will have that processed and fingers crossed this will continue to replicate just as um, uh, into the 12 month data. So we're very excited about that. Um, so with that, you know, I, I think I'll wrap up on time. Um, but, you know, I think the major conclusions of, of, of what we've shown is that, you know, neuroimaging in the early aftermath of trauma um, really might provide some information about the neurobiology that's related to development of post-traumatic dysfunction. And our hope really is that by trying to understand that brain biology, we're going to be able to translate that into new sort of predictive methods and neuroscience-based preventative tools um, to try and intervene early for individuals that might be likely to develop PTSD after trauma. Um, and I think one of the strengths of both the work that you know, we just presented on um, 
is that you know these sort of multimodal fusion techniques really might be the ones that help get us to very generalizable neural signatures. It's one thing if you can find one profile and one sample that might be related in some way, but if we're actually replicating it across samples, I think that's that's really exciting. Um, obviously, we'll need to do more work and establish the robustness of these findings and really try to work hard to develop actual biomarkers. But you know, I think it, I think we have a lot of promise for for what we're doing. Um, so with that, I think that's just about on time. I'm going to go ahead and leave my acknowledgments up. I want to thank um, you all again for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ressler and Dr. Nickerson for nominating me for this. And thank you to the committee for selecting me. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Harnett, for that fantastic talk that packed so much information um, into a very short period of time. And it was really excellent. So thank you so much for that. I just want to remind the audience to please put questions for Dr. Harnett and also for Dr. Lebois into the Q&A, um, just so that we can have um, a Q&A session um, at the conclusion of Dr. Lebois' talk. And with that, it's my um, pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our second awardee, Dr. Lauren Lebois, who is nominated by her mentors, Drs. Melissa Kaufman and Carrie Ressler, Based upon the impact of her first authored peer review publication, Large Scale Functional Brain Network Architecture Changes Associated with Trauma Related Dissociation. Dr. Lauren Lebois is a cognitive psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist who uses neuroimaging, <clears throat> psychophysiological, and behavioral techniques in humans to understand how the mind, brain, and body adapt in the aftermath of trauma. She jointly directs the Dissociative Disorders and Trauma Research Program with um, Drs. Melissa Kaufman at McLean Hospital and is an assistant professor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She also serves as the operations co-director of the Initiative for Integrated Trauma Research Care and Training at McLean. Dr. Lebois's work aims to scientifically examine the predictors and correlates of post-traumatic neuropsychiatric sequelae like PTSD and dissociative identity disorder, and in doing so, reduce stigma and improve psychiatric care. Her work so far has shed light on why there is a therapeutic effect of mindfulness-related treatments, the role of learning experience and plasticity and emotional experience, the assessment of brain and behavioral correlates of pathological dissociation. Recently, Dr. Lebois was awarded the Morton Prince Award from the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation for our outstanding cumulative contributions to research on dissociative disorders. She's currently supported by a KO1 career development grant from the NIMH. It's a pleasure, as you can see, to welcome Dr. Lebois for her presentation today toward a neurobiological fingerprint of trauma-related dissociation. Dr. Lebois? Thank you so much, Dr. Greenfield. Um, and thank you all for having me um, and for the recognition of the Pope Award. I feel um, very aware really of the sheer privilege of being here and of having a meaningful, a meaningful direction to walk in with my work um, and that I get to do so in the company of such wonderful colleagues, mentors, and friends, in particular, Drs. Carrie Ressler and Melissa Kaufman. Uh, who through their generosity of presence in my life in large part have made this work possible. Um, and another one of those wonderful people is Dr. Harnett. So I feel especially honored to be receiving this award jointly with him. Um, if you'll indulge me one more thank you, I want to acknowledge all of the co-authors who made um, the work that I'll be talking about today happen. Uh, and with that, I will jump in. So first, I want to talk to you about what I mean by the term dissociation. What does it sound like in someone's own words? So a lot of people talk about feeling detached or like everything goes dull, feeling outside of their body, numb, like you're watching a movie about your life, um, feeling like you're on autopilot or that everything just goes blank. Uh, questioning whether or not you're real. Uh, people talk about how everything feels unfamiliar and also like sometimes even like they're watching a complete stranger go about their business. So what these folks are talking about is a disruption or a discontinuity in the typical integration of their psychological functioning. And it spans, dissociation spans a broad spectrum of symptoms. And I'm gonna walk you through a few of them that we uh, measured in the, the study I'll be talking to you about today. 
So different types of dissociation include depersonalization and derealization. So a lot of the things that we saw in the previous slide are examples of these. So these feelings of detachment from your sense of self, your own mind and body, um, and also from your surroundings. So feeling like things are strange or unfamiliar in your surroundings. Um, another type of dissociation includes amnesia. So gaps in your memory, and these can be gaps for important personal information, um, daily events, mundane events, or even aspects of traumatic experiences that you've experienced personally. People can also experience flashbacks. So this sense that a traumatic event from the past is actually happening again in the present moment, uh, even though it's not. Numbing, where people have this restriction in their capacity to feel either in the positive or negative direction. Passive influence phenomena, where your own feelings and thoughts feel ego alien, like they're not your own. And then finally, um, identity alteration, where aspects of your own sense of self can feel separate somehow, almost like different people living in your mind. So many of these experiences can show up right in the moment as you're experiencing a potential threat and, the, in, and in the direct aftermath. Um, but they can also become chronic habitual responses over time, in, um, even when those potential threats are no longer present. And so that's where we enter the land of PTSD and complex dissociative disorders like dissociative identity disorder. Why do people experience dissociation in the aftermath of trauma? So dissociation actually serves as a really awesome adaptive coping mechanism. It provides this psychological distance. It can protect people from experiencing the full impact of the traumatic events um, that, they're, that are happening in their life. So it's this life raft to survive these terrible experiences. And in particular, in the case of, for example, childhood trauma, um, creating this distance, feeling like there's some separation between what's happening to you or it feels unreal in some way, um, that allows the child to still attach to a caregiver who's maltreating them, um, but they need them to survive because they're just a child. So that's really the function of, that dissociation can serve. But this kind of the terrible paradox is that while it, 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 it does serve as this life raft, it's also incredibly disabling. It can really in, interfere with people's ability to function in the day-to-day, -day, uh, both at a personal level and a societal level, as people um, who experience lots of these symptoms often have self-destructive behaviors and high uh, rates of suicidality, and also are disproportionate treatment utilizers. Furthermore, what's really challenging about symptoms like these is that they're largely experienced internally. So it's a subjective internal experience um, and it can be really hard for clinicians and researchers to know when someone is dissociating. We rely almost wholly on their ability to tell us, their self-report that they're experiencing these things. And that's where I think brain-based measures have the potential to, to help us. They, they could augment self-reports in these cases because they could serve as this objective measure of dissociation. We wouldn't necessarily have to re rely fully on someone's ability to be able to tell us or be aware that they're experiencing these things. We already know some of what's going on in the brain when someone is feeling dissociative. Um, so there's foundational work that's demonstrated entrenched patterns of something I'll call top-down cortical limbic inhibition. So when someone is feeling triggered and dissociative. And I'll unpack what I mean by that now. So cortical regions of the brain, like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that are involved in emotion and arousal regulation, these regions actually serve to uh, inhibit limbic regions like the amygdala. And the amygdala can help us mount a bodily stress response to deal with whatever potential threat is in our environment. So when someone's feeling triggered and dissociative, the neurobiological correlates of emotion and arousal regulation are an overdrive, actually. The brakes are on too tightly on areas like the amygdala and insula. 
And so it's not mounting this bodily stress response and people are reporting feeling detached and numb instead of what you might think of um, more typically of feeling hyper aroused in the, in the, um, when you're experiencing a potential threat. So instead, when someone's feeling dissociative, we get in the body this, this decreased arousal. Um, so you get decreased autonomic arousal, like decreased heart rate and blood pressure. But this work so far, um, it tells us about average patterns of what's going on in the brain for when people are experiencing dissociation. Um, and it doesn't mean that if we zoomed in on any one individual with these symptoms, that they would necessarily have this average pattern, given that there's substantial variability in brain structure and function across individuals. So it's really an open question whether it's possible to look in an individual person's brain and determine the extent that they experience dissociative symptoms. Said another way, um, is there a biological marker of dissociation that could serve as a sort of fingerprint that we could use to consistently identify this in a single person? So that's exactly what we tried to do in this study. We wanted to see if by just looking at what was going on in someone's brain, could we predict what they were writing down on their self-report questionnaire of dissociative symptoms? And to do this, we looked at an adult cohort of women, all of whom had PTSD, and then half of whom also had uh, dissociative identity disorder. They were all seeking treatment at McLean Hospital at, at various levels of care. Um, and I just wanna highlight one exclusion criteria. We did exclude anyone who had a history or, or was currently experiencing a, a psychotic disorder. I also wanna highlight that everyone in our sample had a severe history of childhood trauma and current PTSD with various levels of dissociation um, as measured by um, the multi-dimensional inventory of dissociation, a self-report that we used. So we had some people who were reporting very low or almost no dissociative symptoms and some people who had almost all the dissociative symptoms that I talked about at the very start of the talk. So we had a full range. Just to give you a high level view of what we were asking people to do um, when they came in for a study visit. So we had a battery of clinical diagnostic interviews. So gold standard assessments of post-traumatic stress disorder and dissociative disorders. They also did a number of self-report measures. And today I'll just highlight the multi-interventional inventory of dissociation. Um, it gives us this, this average score of all the different types of dissociative symptoms um, that people could experience and how severe it was for that person in particular. People did neuropsychological testing and also, of course, a magnetic resonance imaging scan. And in the scan, we had people do both a challenging attention task, a number of emotion processing tasks, and a resting state scan where we give them no particular task. Um, they're just asked to to rest. Um, and I'll just say that for the results I'll be talking about today, we combined all of that data together. So the task and the resting state data together. Um, so when I talk about what we found, it's kind of in a way task independent. We've, we've looked at all these things and put it together. Um, so it's not specific to a particular task. Okay, so just to remind you, we're, what we're trying to do is figure out if we can look at what's going on in the brain and use that to predict what someone put down on their self-report for their dissociation severity. So what do we measure in the brain to do this? So we looked at functional connectivity of intrinsic brain networks. And I'll unpack what I mean by that now, first starting with the first half of that, what's functional connectivity. So increasingly, the field of neuroscience is looking beyond just how a single specific region fires in the brain um, and is instead moving towards understanding how different mental processes are supported by networks of regions active at the same time. And the idea is if they're active at the same time, they're presumably involved in a common function and they're thought to be functionally connected. We call this functional connectivity in the field. Okay, so the second half, what about the intrinsic brain networks? So researchers have begun to identify brain networks that all humans seem to have, 
and how they support different functions. And these networks can be seen while people are at rest with no task or when they're given a task to do in the imaging scanner. So to pull this all together, we measured functional connectivity, a measure of the extent to which brain regions are active at the same time of these networks to try to predict our dissociation scores. And to do this, our analysis approach, um, we used machine learning, which is a, um, a type of artificial intelligence. And we used, uh, we used this approach to measure the functional connectivity and predict dissociation on an individual basis. So I'll at a high level walk you through how we did this and I'm happy to get into more of the details in the question period. But at a high level, so um, we had our self-report questionnaire measure of dissociation and brain functional connectivity data. So we had a subset of those. And I'll, I'll just add that Dr. Um, Mei-Ling Li and Hesheng Liu, their team developed a unique way to extract the connectivity from an individual um, that I won't be getting into the details of now, but again, happy to talk about at the end. But they have a unique novel way of doing this. But essentially we have our self-report data, our functional connectivity data, a subset of that. We use that subset to generate a model identifying which brain connections predict the dissociation scores. So for those of you familiar with this, the machine learning algorithm we used to generate this model was support vector regression. Um, once we have this model of which connections matter, we apply this to a single new research participant to see if the model can estimate their dissociation score just based on the brain connections. Again, the intrinsic network functional connectivity. Um, so we, re we then repeat this a ton of times. We did a thousand permutations of this. For those of you familiar with this, it's the leave one out cross validation. And what happens when you do something like this is the outcomes, you get this really nice group level prediction where we have our actual dissociation scores on the x-axis and the prediction, the predicted dissociation score on the y. So what our model told us the dissociation score would be. And this allows us to see how we did in our model. So how did we do? Here are some of our results. So you can see on the x-axis are the actual scores that people reported on their questionnaire of dissociation. On the y, the scores that our model predicted, so our functional connectivity model, what it was predicting their score would be. And as you can see, it was significant. So we have a, a moderately high correlation between the two here. We were able to account for approximately 25% of the variance in someone's self-reported dissociation score just using what we knew about what was going on in their brain with the functional connectivity. So we could predict dissociation in a single person just based on what was happening in their brain. Of course, it's not perfect, but um, we've shown here that it's possible. But what was going on in the brain that predicted the dissociation score? So there were two networks actually that emerged as central to these predictions. One was the default mode network and the second was the frontal parietal control network. So the default mode network is involved in internally focused attention, thinking about things related to your sense of self. The frontal parietal control network is involved in uh, executive functioning. So things like problem solving, working memory, decision making, things like that. And there's some interesting research that shows when these networks are co-active, when they're active at the same time, um, people are often involved in internally focused problem solving. And co-activation of these networks is exactly what predicted the dissociation scores in our cohort of women with childhood abuse and PTSD. So in our results, a pattern of hyperconnectivity between the default mode network and the frontal parietal control network emerged the more dissociative symptoms people had. So you can see this mapped out on the brain here in the slide. Uh, the red regions are regions that were more likely to be co-active um, the more dissociative someone was, the more dissociative they were reporting on their self-report questionnaire. Um, and you can see that these regions are largely in the default mode and the frontal parietal control network. So this suggests that this pattern of functional connectivity is a key predictor of trauma-related dissociative symptoms. 
So to pull all this together, we were able to use the brain connectivity to predict the dissociative symptoms in an individual and the brain connectivity that mattered was the co-activation of the default mode network and frontal parietal control network. But why do we care? So I think I have two main things I wanna talk about for why, why we care about results like this. So first, I think um, biologically based results like these actually do something really interesting. So they increase the awareness and also the legitimacy of symptoms like dissociation. Uh, and there's this interesting cascade effect that can happen. So once you increase the legitimacy of um, dissociative symptoms or any, any other psychiatric symptoms, um, people are more aware of them. So they're more aware that they're a thing and that they might be a thing for them that they could seek help for. Um, and then when they do, when they are more likely to seek that help, they're more likely to receive adequate care because clinicians and practitioners are more likely to be aware that dissociation is a thing and they learn about it and they're aware of the how to assess for it and what um, that there that there are treatments for it and they're actually really great helpful treatments for dissociative symptoms um, and then finally um, I think the final building block is that insurance companies are more likely to cover these treatments so I think that's the first reason that results like these are important and then scientifically I think these results bring us closer to having a stable symptom biomarker, so that neurobiological fingerprint of dissociation that we could use when individuals are maybe unable to effectively use self-reports to, to report on their symptoms. So for example, you could imagine a scenario where someone either consciously or unconsciously minimizes or exaggerates, I guess, um, their symptoms on a self-report. And so the self-report isn't valid or a situation where someone is wanting objective corroborating evidence, for example, in um, court proceedings to go along with what someone's able to tell us about their symptoms. So in scenarios like these, down the line, we could use what we know about the neurobiological fingerprint of dissociation to augment um, what someone's able to tell us on a self-report. Of course, we are really far off from being able to do this, um, but our results that I've talked about here today are kind of a proof of concept. So they're a first step in this direction of getting there down the line. Um, and with that, I want to thank you all for your time and willingness to be a part of this conversation together. And um, I guess I hand it back to you, Carrie, to talk about questions. Outstanding. Fantastic job, both Lauren and Nate. Thank you both so much for your invaluable work and commitment towards improving um, the field of neuropsychiatry research. Really, really beautiful talks. Um, so we have several questions and we have about, um, about five, or five or eight minutes for questions, so terrific. Um, so we'll start, um, um, Nate, with a question for you from um, Dan Dillon. Um, it's a great talk. What do you think is going on in the visual cortex that would confer susceptibility to PTSD? Do you think there's a global hyperactivity, stronger connectivity to the amygdala, or something else going on? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Dillon. It's a great question. It's something I think that we're struggling with, um, and especially in regards to a lot of the data that we're, we've gotten over the last couple of years. Um, so even looking out, you know, looking at a lot of PTSD literature that's published, even if you're focusing on core threat neurocircuitry like the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, um, you still tend to see sort of these positive correlations with visual cortex activity and PTSD symptoms or greater activity in PTSD, individuals with PTSD. And in fact, in um, some other work that we've done in highly traumatized, um, high, high community trauma samples um, at UAB, we found that you know, there's this sort of like threat sensitization that happens within the within the visual cortex and all the other sensory cortices. So like the first sort of speculative guess is that it could be um, that in individuals that are more susceptible, visual cortex is more sensitized for potential threat interaction, for potential threat detection due to possibly greater connectivity between the amygdala. Um, it might be the case that this same sort of circuitry is helping to um, promulgate over consolidation of potential threat memories from the amygdala, um, really thinking about potentially um, over generalization of visual stimuli that might be related to the trauma. Um, uh, 
leading to this sort of effect where for those individuals, it might be something that is more easily retrieved, um, even erroneously leading to PTSD. I think it's a great question and something that we're still thinking about. I mean, I think, again, I think threat sensitization is the first thing we go for. Terrific. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, um, Lauren, so a question, a question from Robbie Finster. Um, great talk. Congratulations to both of you. Um, Robbie points out um, a paper from Carl Dieserwald's lab, which is traditionally a, a mouse lab that came out this past year, it was pretty um, talking about rhythmic activity in the retrosplenial cortex, um, potentially sufficient for dissociative symptoms in mice. Now, obviously, being able to tell other mouses dissociating is a very complex thing, but his concrete question is, um, do you see that area in, um, in your findings? Yeah, so retrospinal cortex, posterior cingulate. Um, I, yeah, we do see uh, we do see it. It kind of depends on what dissociation you're talking about, and it like the. I'm trying to remember now if uh, Dr. Lanius sees it in some of her her more like looking at average activity across people. I'm having a hard time remembering off the top of my head, but that area of the brain is, it's kind of an association cortex. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's really highly involved um, in dissociation. And I'm curious to probe it further in some of our net, like if we look at the network-based functional connectivity, if we could see that, um, especially with the DICERAF results, it'll be exciting to try and tie those together because I think it would make for some really powerful um, translational work. So yeah, a short answer, I don't really know, but it would make sense to me that it, it would be involved. And I wonder if, um, you know, one question that probably comes of all of this kind of work, certainly in a, in a rodent model, but in humans as well, is how do you, can we say for sure what's the precision of the brain marker for dissociation versus if you looked at delirium or sleepiness or other things, would you see maybe similar patterns on it, especially imagine in a mouse model, almost anything that looked like they weren't as attentive, um, you might could call the association phenotype, but it may be a very different thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Carrie. I, I, but I think it's important to be gathering things across all these all these different levels so that when we put it together, we can have a, a really more comprehensive and generalizable story. And I think Nate, your work speaks to that too, with looking at things multimodally. Like I think it, just so we can bring the whole picture together, that, that would be really important. Great. Um, let's see, maybe a question for you, Nate, though it could be relevant to either one from Abby Moline um, at the beginning. Um, thinking about um, predictive markers or potential signatures of risk and wondering if um, the visual, if, if, and I don't think we have the data yet, but if you would imagine that if you were to look at first degree relatives, for example, of those with PTSD or other people who might have a genetic susceptibility to PTSD, do you think you might see some of these visual signature changes as well? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I can't remember exactly what the percentage of risk are. I think I'll leave that to you, Dr. Ressler, you're the geneticist. Um, but there is definitely a genetic overlap for, for PTSD and, and sort of a risk factor for those who are linked familially. Um, one of the things that when recruiting for non-trauma exposed individuals for one of our prior studies we did is we specifically, we had a conversation I remember about, oh, we could just get people who were like the brother or sister who wasn't in a car accident. We said, no, uh, that might add some sort of genetic com confound that we didn't want to deal with at the time. But you know, now looking back, it would have been great to have three groups, one that was sort of familial linked, one that wasn't familial linked, and then see, you know, in these individuals that um, didn't have trauma, but you know, were, were related familially, if that might, if that might be something that's more of like a pre-traumatic marker for those individuals. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it'd be a really cool thing to do um, and definitely something to think about right now, actually. <laughs> Terrific. Um, Elliot Gelwin, who's a um, psychiatrist and co-director of the STU, um, says, Lauren, um, that he's, has, there's a related presentation of dissociation with complex partial seizures, um, a sort of organic dissociation that looks a lot like depersonalization and derealization. Wondering how, if we know anything, what your thoughts are about how that might be similar or different from um, post-traumatic dissociation. Um, and he also talks about derealization disorder that's sometimes seen without dissociative precipitants. So if you have any thoughts about these other kinds of phenotypes. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I think um, 
I think that there's likely some overlap and uh, Simone Reinders and uh, master students of hers recently put out this really great review that kind of puts all these things together. Um, well, she looks across disorders um, to show that there are some similarities, a lot going on in the prefrontal cortex may be conserved across um, different conditions like derealization disorder or organic causes of dissociation compared to trauma related dissociation like you might see in PTSD or DID. Um, but I think there are likely some areas of the brain that are unique or specific to the different types, the trauma related versus non-trauma related. And I think the short answer is we, we just don't really know yet, but it will be, I think that's a key aim for the field to understand what's unique and different across those, those different causal conditions. Wonderful. And maybe a last question um, from Kate Dahlgren from the Gruber Group. Um, question for Nate, but maybe Lauren, too, if you want to chime in. Um, what do you think of, given, given both of these talks back to back, what do you think about dissociation symptoms and your findings, Nate, in multimodal analysis? If you, did you account for dissociation? If you did, do you still think you would see these visual association phenotypes? What are your thoughts? That's a great question. Um, and Dr. LeBois, it'd be great once we have some more of the Aurora data to start looking at um, multimodal structural markers of dissociation. So we should talk about that. Um, yeah, you know, I think in the initial analyses that we did, um, I, I believe there is a marker of dissociation, um, including the GTP data. We honestly didn't look at it. So I actually have no clue um, what, what the impact or what the associations um, of dissociative symptoms, of, of paratraumatic dissociative symptoms might be on some of the structural markers that we have. And it may be the case that there are some of the networks that we've already looked at or some of the profiles that might be more tied to dissociation than they are to, to PTSD. Um, although I will say that, you know, I'm excited about some of the collaborations in Aurora to look a bit more transdiagnostically than within just saying PTSD or just dissociation, trying to think about these a more holistically. Um, so I honestly don't know, um, and Dr. Lebois, it'd be great to get your thoughts if there are any particular structural networks that you think might be involved. Yeah, that's, that's something that people don't highlight a lot in the dissociation literature, but there are some, there's usually always like some visual activity that pops up and people like talk about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala stuff more. Um, so I think it's kind of an untapped area, but it does pop up. And so I'm curious to see how it would change if we accounted for that and the results you're talking about, Nate. We'd be excited to look at those. Wonderful. Well, thank you both again, I think. Um, you know, this could have really been an international level symposium on cutting edge approaches to imaging and PTSD. We're very proud of you. And it's really great, you know, with, with, our, with our own Scott Roush, um, who many may not realize, you know, really began the field of imaging and PTSD in the 90s. So it's really great to see this ongoing in such great ways. Um, for the second year, um, we are celebrating, unfortunately, the Pope Awardees remotely. But if we were all together in Pierce Hall, we would now give you a standing ovation. And for each of you with your plaque and envelope, um, your award certificate will be coming um, via mail, and we um, really have the most deep appreciation for all that you guys are doing in the next generation of research. I'd like to give everyone to give Nate and um, Lauren a loud round of applause. Congrats again, um, and thank you so much, Shelly and Chris and Marjorie and Caroline and others um, who made this possible this year. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Look forward to next, next steps and next work. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.